Haggai. And as we resume uh, the exposition of this short book of the prophets, one of the uh, minor prophets, minor in terms of its length, but certainly not in terms of its message, I'd ask you if you would look in your Bibles, if you're using the Pew Bible, it's page 1470. I don't know what page it is in your own Bible, uh, but it's, in, it's uh, not far from Matthew if you just turn back several books. Agai chapter 2 verses 10 through 19. It is God's word. It may seem foreign to us being so far removed from the temple, the physical temple, from the ceremonial law. But this is God's word for us even today. It is his inspired, his inerrant, his infallible word. And so it speaks truth that we also need to hear. So let's please listen carefully and pray that God would help us understand rightly his word today. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priests what the law says. If a person carries consecrated meat in the fold of his garment, and that fold touches some bread or stew, or stew, some wine, oil, or other food, does it become conse consecrated? The priest answered, no. Then Haggai said, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Yes, the priests replied, it becomes defiled. Then Haggai said, so it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. Now give careful thought to this from this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to a heap of twenty measures, there were only ten. When anyone went to a wine vat to draw fifty measures, there were only twenty. I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail. Yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Lord. From this day on, from this 24th day of the ninth month, give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. Is there yet any seed left in the barn? Until now, the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit. From this day on, I will bless you. Amen. Let's pray. Father, help us. Help us, please, that what we have read we might understand, that what we understand by the power of the Holy Spirit might be applied, that we would live according to your laws, that we would seek your face, that we would put sin far from us and acknowledge our need of you. And so we ask, O oh Lord, please, as we come to your holy word, we pray and ask that you would make us your holy people. Create in us a clean heart, we pray, along with the psalmist. For we ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. We might be saying to ourselves, wow, <laughs> why are we looking at this? What in the world does this have to do with anything? I don't even understand what the words themselves are referring to. But what seems very far away and inapplicable to our lives today actually has a wonderful principle that we see illustrated throughout the Old Testament in the ceremonial law. And it is simply this, that sin separates us from God. Did you hear it? Sin separates. 
The entire ceremonial law in the Old Testament, which, by the way, has been done away with by Jesus Christ, it is part of the grace and glory of the New Covenant that we are no longer bound by the ceremonial laws of the Old Covenant, but all of that was given in God's grace to teach His people, including us, that fellowship with a holy God demands holiness. We must be pure. We must, as the psalmist again says, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Who can come into the Lord's presence? Only the one who has clean hands and a clean heart. And so before we pray, we confess our sins. Before we come into the sanctuary of the Lord, we, we consider our ways. But friends, you and I know that the stain of sin adheres even to our best works. As Isaiah says, even our most righteous deeds are as filthy rags, unclean in God's sight because He is holy, pure, absolutely holy, and cannot stand even the sight or presence of sin. So what hope is there for us? Well, in the Old Covenant, God revealed a way to come to Him. And it was through the, temp the tabernacle and then the temple, through the priesthood that He Himself had set up. This is why the ceremonial law was so important for them and why their disobedience caused God to judge them. Because by their disobedience, they were saying in effect to God, I don't care what you say, you had better let me come into your presence my way. And God said, no, 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 no. It doesn't work like that. And so here, after the exile, after God had judged His people for their idolatry, for their spiritual adultery, sent them out of the land into exile, He brings them back. He brings them back in grace. He brings them back as a measure of His love for them and as a preparation that His people might be in the land when the Son of God Himself is born. And He has them rebuild a temple. Ezra and Nehemiah, the historical books, give us this picture of the history of the return of God's people from exile and the beginning of the rebuilding of the temple. But you might remember from Ezra 3 that the, though the temple was begun, it was, it was abandoned because of outside pressure. There were people, the peoples around them that were resettled in the land from the Babylonians and the Assyrians that were saying, hey, let us be a part of this. And they said, no, you can't. And so they made life hard. And in making life hard, the work was let go. If you remember from our beginning of this series in Haggai 1, this was the word of the Lord to the people. Why is my house in ruins when your houses are being paneled? Where are your priorities? Consider your ways. And the people responded in obedience, repentance and obedience and faith. And God comes to Haggai then this third time on the 24th day of the nine month, three months after they had begun, after his first message, they had gathered the materials. There was another ceremony to lay again the foundation stone of the Lord's temple. And here the Lord says to them again, remember that sin defiles, but I will bless you. I will bless you out of my exceeding grace. I will bless you not because of what you have done. You didn't earn this blessing. This is a blessing because of who I am, not because of what you have done. I will bless you. Well, let's look at this then in a little more detail because it's fascinating for us to understand the implications of sin's defilement. On the 24th day, we've mentioned that Haggai's uh, prophecies, his sermons as they were, are dated. That gives us a good historical understanding of when this came. As I said, three months later, uh, he comes to him this third time. And this is what the Lord Almighty says, verse 11, ask the priests what the law says. The priests should know. 
They're the ones that were charged with studying God's revealed will, His Word. The Pentateuch was written to give their instruction to all the people, but the priests were given to instruct the people. And so Haggai the prophet, probably in the temple precincts, right there around where they were beginning the rebuilding work, says to the priests that were there, if a person carries consecrated meat, that is holy meat, something that had been offered to God, it was set apart from the regular profane secular use, and it was given to God, offered to Him, probably as a fellowship offering. If that piece of meat, not a full burnt offering, something that was offered but then released, least, as it were, from the altar to be consumed by priests or even the person that offered it. If a person carries that piece of consecrated meat, that piece of the sacrifice in a fold in his garment, and that fold, that garment, touches something else, whether it's bread or stew, wine, oil, other food, does that other stuff become consecrated? Does it also then become holy in the sight of the Lord? And the answer is no. Holiness isn't passed on like that. Consecration is not done in, uh, through an intermediary. We don't get sanctified, or let me put it this way, you don't get, kids, you won't get saved by your grandmother's prayers. Your grandmother can be the most godly woman you know, and I pray that she is. And she might be praying for you each and every day. In fact, that might be one of the greatest blessings of your life. But her prayers will not save you. Her salvation isn't passed on like that. But God does hear her prayers, and by His grace you will be saved. But no... This fold, when it touches something else, doesn't, become, doesn't make that something else consecrated. So Haggai asks next, verse 13, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body. And let me just pause there. There are a number of ways in the Old Testament for you to be defiled, for you to be ceremonially unclean, ritually unable to come into the temple to offer your sacrifices. Perhaps there was some kind of discharge or skin disease that sent you away, kept you away. Pray Praise God, by the way, that the new covenant allows all people immediate access to God. Praise the Lord that we have a great high priest who has entered the heavenly places and we don't have to go through a mediary. And God doesn't look at the outward man and say, no, no, you're deformed in some way. You can't come near me. No, he says, come near me. Come near me. But if a person's defiled by contact with a dead body, that defilement was worse than any skin disease or discharge. Why? Well, one of the things that God is teaching us, and one of the things that we need to be reminded of, is that the wages of sin is death. That death itself signifies something more than just our mortal life passing away. It is the direct consequence of sin entering into this world. This is not the way it's supposed to be. But because of sin, because of our rebellion, we encounter death all the time. And if we are defiled, if a person is defiled by contact with a dead body, that defilement kept them impure to such a degree that they could not celebrate the Passover even. Imagine that. One time a year, you have a chance to celebrate. To celebrate the Passover, that great redemptive event that was remembered every year by God's people. And you can't do it. Maybe some of you have had a similar, um, though not exact, but a similar experience over Christmas. Maybe you were sick with the flu. And Christmas just wasn't the same because you were laid up in bed and it was feeling awful. Well, sin defiles. And it keeps people away. But this is what the Lord teaches too. Not only does it separate us from God, but this defilement is transmitted. It is contagious. If a def person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, bread, stew, wine, oil, other food, does, does it become defiled? Yes, it does. The pollution of sin is more serious than I think we sometimes imagine. What sin has done to our hearts is not isolated. 
It is not something that we can put in a little jar and hide away so that other people don't see it and think that it doesn't matter. We're here this morning because we love the Lord, I pray. But maybe there's something in your heart that is continuing to keep you separated from God. Some sin that you've cherished and won't let go of. Perhaps it is some kind of unforgiving spirit where the Lord has told you and told us through Scripture in Matthew 5 as well as Matthew 18 that unless we forgive the person who sinned against us, God won't forgive us. We're separated from Him. In Matthew 5, the Beatitudes, He says, if you bring your gift to the altar and remember that there's someone who has an offense a you've offended leave your gift at the altar and go and be reconciled what we fail to remember so often is that the sin of yesterday sticks to us unless we repent and there is a solution for sin that's God's grace that's the gospel but we take God's grace for granted we presume upon it. We say, oh, I, I, I prayed for forgiveness a long time ago. That sin's no big deal. It doesn't really matter how I treat my brother or sister. It doesn't really matter whether I lie or cheat or steal. My heart greed is really of no big deal. It's no, no consequence. I can come and I can sing. I can come and I can pray. I can come and I can give. I can worship, no problem. I feel fine. But sin, sin separates. And sin is contagious. Sin defiles. And so what Haggai says to the people, so it is in verse 14, with this people in this nation in my sight declares the Lord, whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. Doesn't matter, God is saying, if you bring your offerings week after week, if your hearts are far from me. It doesn't matter if with your lips you say one thing, if your heart is far from me. Your hearts are defiled, and they defile the offering you bring. You see, they thought, and we think, that the sacrifice itself would sanctify them. That if they did the right thing, they would be right. We think today not about sacrificing lambs or goats or things like that, but we think in moral terms. If I'm a good person, I must be good in God's sight. If I don't tell too many lies, if I'm not a cheater, if I don't steal, then I must be right. But morality will not save us. Our morality should be instead evidence, even as their sacrifices were, of sanctified hearts. In other words, God changes us, and our actions then change. What we see in verse, verses 11, verses 10 to 14, is God exposing the contagious nature of sin, the defilement that comes when our hearts are far from Him, the separation that cannot be overcome from our side, and a reminder that there is a price. Fellowship with God demands purity. Let me just make sure that we understand that also from the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 7, just turn there quickly with me if you would. Matthew chapter 7, we're not far from it if you're in Haggai and your Bibles are open. Matthew chapter 7, verses 14 to 23. We have, or I'm sorry, Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, you're still close. Mark chapter 7, verses 14 to 23. 
We have Jesus giving some instruction to the crowd. And he says this, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. It's what comes out. After he, had left the crowd, after he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. And he said, Are you so dull? Don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? For it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach and then out his body. And saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, What comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, folly, all these sin sins come from inside and make a man unclean. You might say to yourself, and you might say to God, that's, that's, wait, 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 that's not me. I go to church every Sunday. I pray before every meal. I'm a good person. And God will say to you, but look at your heart. Friends, look at your heart. Consider your ways. Lay this to your heart. All these things are found in each one of us. I'm not excluding myself by any means. From a man's heart come these unclean things. And this impurity, this is defilement. It separates us from God. Proverbs 4.23 says the same thing. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Now, going back to Haggai, we might ask ourselves, what was their particular defilement? What was their particular disobedience? Well, it had to do with their heart and what they thought about God. But it was seen in the fact that the temple was still unbuilt. Joyce Baldwin in her Old Testament commentary has very picturesque language when, when she writes, The skeleton of the ruined temple was like a corpse decaying and making everything else contaminated. J. Moiter says that this unfinished work showed the Lord as well as everyone else that they didn't really care if God was in their midst. Isn't that interesting to think about? How do we show people that God matters? For the Old Testament people of God, they showed it by their attention to the details of God's law. God said, my house will be my dwelling place among you. And so by them rel relinquishing that work, turning their attention to their own houses, they were basically saying to God and everyone else, you know what? It doesn't really matter if you dwell in our midst. It doesn't really matter if you're here. I want your blessings, so I'll continue to bring my sacrifices, but your presence isn't really required. Now let's just bring that home. How often... Do we get so caught up in our own lives, in our own homes, in our own desires, that we pray for God's blessing? Lord, help my job to go well. Help school to go well. Help my health. But really, we're not that concerned about His presence. That we feel like we can do life okay even if God is not with us. How do we show that? We show that by making time with Him very low on our priority list. We can get through the day just fine, thank you very much, even without you, Lord. Friends, let's not do that. Let's show by our actions what our hearts and lips say out loud on Sunday mornings. That we want to be His people. We want to be in His presence. We want to know the gifts, but we also want to know the giver of those gifts. We want to know His blessing, but we want to see His face. You see, when they were not committed to building God's house, it was a testimony that He didn't matter. Now, by God's grace, we have a roof over our heads this morning. 
and heat. Thank you, Lord. But this is not the building that God is most concerned about. He is concerned about your hearts. He is concerned about your lives. Paul says in 1 Corinthians that we are the temple of the Lord. He says, in fact, to each one individually, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And Peter says that we are living stones. Are we concerned about the building of God's house? The temple that Jesus Christ is the foundation of, that He is making us into. How does that look? It looks like we take time to be holy. It looks like we take time to spend time in His presence. It looks like we encourage one, one another spiritually. It looks like our prayers sound different because what matters most to us is not the circumstances of our life, but of our hearts. Will we build the Lord's house? Well, in verses 15 to 19, Haggai gives a promise as well. And it's a wonderful thing. I said there's a solution to sin, and it's God's grace. The solution to sin is God. It's not what we do, but what He does. The solution to sin is listening to the promise of God and believing it. So now give careful thought, he says, from this day on. And then he gives this, uh, the, this reminder of all that they had expected that hadn't come true. You come to a heap of grain for 20 measures, there were only 10. You, you, you threshed it out and all the chaff blew away and what was left was half of what you thought was there. When you came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were only 20, 60% less than you thought. All those grapes heaped up when they were pressed down, only 20 measures came out. I struck all the work of your hands. This is what the Lord says. Don't think that God is disinterested or disengaged in your lives. He wasn't in the Old Testament. He isn't today. And this is what he says to his people then. I struck all the works of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail. The discipline of God is for those he loves. But listen to what the prophet says next. Yet you did not turn to me. All of this, all of this being smote, smitten with God's discipline, with His chastising hand, was so that they would turn. Friends, when you and I go through trials, when we experience afflictions, when things do not go like we think they should, is our first response to turn to the Lord and cry out for help and say, Lord, I need you. So show me my heart if there are things that are displeasing in my life. Show me and I will repent. Cleanse me. Renew me. Or is it to power through to with a stiff upper lip say, I can do this. No. No, what we need to do is pause and pray and say, Lord, what are you trying to teach me? Uh, Gil, I think it was uh, the great expositor uh, uh, Dr. Gill, and I've forgotten his first name, and his commentary says this on, he says, afflictions, unless sanctified, have no effect upon men to turn them from their sins to the Lord. Afflictions, unless sanctified, have no effect upon men to turn them from their sins to the Lord. And do you want to see a good example of that, that all, almost all of us in this room remember? 9-11. Do you remember 9-11? Those planes flying into the World Trade Towers? The response? Congress going out to the steps and singing, God bless America? Praying? But how long were the churches filled? Afflictions unless sanctified, unless by the grace of God turned, have no lasting effect upon us to turn us from our sins. Pray that whatever affliction you're facing, whatever difficulty you're enduring, pray that God would sanctify it. It may be physical. It may be health-related. You may be, be just down because things do not seem like there's light at the end of the tunnel. It may be financial. It may be relational. 
It may be something that you just can't get over. Something someone has legitimately done to you that causes you to legitimately be disconcerted. Whatever afflictions you are facing, pray that the Lord would help you to sanctify them so that you will more and more turn from your sins and turn to the Lord and pray for His blessing and His grace. And that's the promise. That's the promise of verse 19. From verse 18 on, God says, if from this day on, mark it down on your calendars, from this day on, the 24th day of the ninth month, from this day on, I will bless you. Those blessings were to be seen in the coming harvest, anticipated by faith in God keeping His promise for the old covenant people in Haggai's day. But our blessing is much greater. Our blessing is Christ. You see, we also have been defiled by sin, and our sin separates us from a holy God. But Christ has come, and Christ has come as the new great high priest, the one who has entered the heavenly places and brings us with him. You see, the promise of God's blessing is that we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. The promise of the blessing for us in the new covenant is that we can come to God directly to know His favor, to experience His grace through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because He has sent His Son, we have life. We have joy. We have peace. The finished work of Jesus Christ, our great high priest, who offered himself up for us on behalf of our sins to take our guilt away, that once for all sacrifice means that we can come boldly to the throne of grace for help in our time of need. Means that we know the blessing of God with us. Means that we are living stones being built up, sanctified, set apart for His use here on this earth. Please, make sure that you think about the defilement of sin. Make sure that you teach your children of how contagious sin is. Make sure that you teach them that God looks at the heart and not simply at their outward actions. Their behavior is important, but their heart is more important. And as we know the defilement of sin, make sure that you also teach them and remind yourself of the coming of Christ, the Savior. And it's not just the coming of Christ that we announce that's the good news. That's the gospel. That's the way to advance the kingdom. Declare to the world that Jesus Christ has come to save us from our sins. But don't just talk about the coming of Christ. Press home the need to come to Christ. Don't stand far off thinking that your sins will forever separate you from the one true living holy God. Yes, your sins separate you from God. But Jesus Christ has come to take your sin upon Himself, nail it to a tree, and rise again on the third day. Don't stay far away. Instead, come to Christ. Come to Christ and know the transformation from the heart outward that He gives. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do ask, please, that in this new year you would help us understand the new things that you are doing. That you would make us delight in the truth that we are new creatures in Christ. That we have new hearts, new lives. And help us, please, Lord, to repent of our sin. For that sin, though it doesn't rain, still remains. It still tempts us. It still, in some ways, clings to us. But that indwelling sin is sin that we are to mortify, we are to put to death, we are to understand that we are crucified with Christ. So please, this new year, this new week, help us to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, 
And Lord, we pray that you would accept us because we are found in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's please turn to hymn 32 and sing as we embark on this new year, Great is thy faithfulness. Let's stand as we...